We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you are interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. Welcome to everyone joining us online this morning. And I want to say good morning again to Pastor Nick Stever and to the dream team of our Louisa campus, who is meeting this morning for the second Sunday in a row as a watch party at the Louisa Arts Center. If we were all in the room right now here in Charlottesville, you would be able to hear our entire Point family celebrating, cheering you on. And uh, last week, it was a great first week of training for our dream team in Louisa. And we are just so excited to be a part of what God is doing in this region as we become one house with two rooms. So excited for what God is doing. Also, if you haven't already heard the news, uh, this past week, we announced our plan to begin in-person gatherings starting Sunday, July 12th. So awesome. So for our Charlottesville campus, uh, this will be our first Sunday gathering on pan tops in our brand new facility. Just let that sink in a minute. And this, that Sunday will also be the first Sunday of the public launch of our Louisa campus. Now, we have a culture at the point where we pray first. Before anything and everything, we pray first. In fact, say it out loud with me. We pray first, all right? We just believe that everything is better and anything is possible if you pray first. So before I send the email, before I make the phone call, before I have a conversation, before I start my day, we pray first. So as we prepare to enter into this season, starting next Sunday, we're gonna be um, going to kick off 21 days of prayer that will lead up to Sunday, July 12th. So the 21 days of prayer, uh, they will be online every morning from 7.30 to 7.45 a.m. Now, again, I'll kick that off next Sunday in the service and then That'll be that time, 7.30 to 7.45 a.m. throughout the week. All right, we're gonna dive into the word. And before we do, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this opportunity you've given us to worship you. And Jesus, we just ask you to speak to our hearts. Lord, we ask you to have your way with our hearts as your word goes forth, accomplish your purposes in our lives, Lord. We believe that the most real part of this moment is your presence. And Lord, in your presence, we cannot stay the same. We are forever and eternally changed. So give us ears to hear, Father. Give us courage to obey. Speak to us, Lord. Change us, Lord, for your glory and for your honor. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a home in our neighborhood with a dog that loves to sit silently off the road at a distance and just and just watch you pass by. It's actually a little bit creepy. And uh, and then after you pass by, what it does is it loves to come running up behind you when you're not paying attention and it just starts barking at you. And it's so loud. And on several occasions, I've run by that home when I'm out on my jog and, and I I have something on my mind and I'm not paying attention. And then the dog comes up behind me and just starts barking. And it has scared the life out of me. I mean, more than once I have jumped, like literally, like I have jumped while I've, while I've been running. And uh, it's a good thing for me that the dog has an underground electric fence. Now, what is interesting is I've noticed that when I'm paying attention, like when I'm aware, when I'm alert, and I'm looking for the dog, if I make eye contact with that dog first, he, he leaves me alone. Like it's so, it's so strange. And uh, my experience really, though, it all comes down to whether or not I'm paying attention. So I want to give you a title for this morning, okay? And it's simply this, pay attention, pay attention, all right? I want you to look to your neighbor, all right? Don't touch them. All of you, Louise, don't touch them. Just look to your neighbor, make eye contact and say, pay attention, all right? If you're watching online, find somebody at home, tell them, pay attention. Today, I want to teach a message I'm calling, pay attention, 
So in a way, this is what Peter is saying in the opening of his letter that we call Second Peter. Your experience in walking with Jesus and walking in the power of Jesus, it, it, it requires that you are paying attention. In Second Peter chapter one, here's what Peter says in verse three. His divine power has given us everything. I want you right now to say out loud, everything. Ready? Everything. He's given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has caught us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So to participate in the divine nature, it means that you're not trying to get God on the same page as you, but you're getting on the same page as God. Like you're not praying, Lord, my kingdom come, my will be done. You're praying, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. And the more and more we participate in his divine nature, the more and more we become like Jesus. The more and more our lives reflect the character of God and the kingdom of God and the life that pleases God. But in order to participate, we've got to make sure we are paying attention. So just imagine if this were our new normal, like not just going through the motions of religion, but as we've been talking about, listening to someone with a different skin color than me, like listening to their experiences, listening to what breaks their hearts. And as Galatians 6.2 says, carrying the burdens of others. And in this way, we fulfill the law of Christ. Like what if my new normal is, is, is not the kingdom of God in some vague sense, but the kingdom of God showing up in power in my life. This is what it means to participate in his divine nature. But we've got to pay attention because if we don't, we're gonna transition into whatever the new normal looks like and it's gonna return to craziness. We're gonna return to hurry. And we're gonna return to a breakneck pace of life and, and to the status quo. And I love what one of my professors in seminary used to say about the status quo. He said that status quo is Latin for the mess we're in. And if we're not paying attention, we're going to return to what we know, to what is familiar. My friend, Lee Domain says it this way. Often what the enemy can't stop, he will accelerate. Think about that one. Another way I've heard that, that very same idea said is this, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy because either way, your soul will shrivel. Or here's one more way to say it. Hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life. Dallas Willard. Hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life. This is why we have to grow in our understanding of our souls, the most real part of who you are and the work that God is doing in our souls. Look, remember, this is why Moses told us in Deuteronomy 4, 9, only take care, pay attention and keep your soul with all diligence. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I made a, a simple comparison comparison of our souls to a football team. And remember what I said, there are three aspects to the game of football, right? There's an offense and a defense, and then there's special teams, okay? That's the, the basic framework of a football team, okay? These three aspects of the game working together. But let's just build on that thought a little bit more th this morning. The more that you engage with football, the more that you pay attention to the game, uh, the more that you learn the intricacies of the game, the more you understand and you appreciate the game, all right? And, and, and you learn that there are positions within the offense and you learn that there are different positions on defense and there are special teams and, and so on. And, and, and those guys who, who are called wide receivers, they block on running plays and on passing plays, they run these things called routes, right? Which are these designated patterns so that the 
quarterback knows where they will be and where to throw the ball. And, and then those big guys up front, uh, they, they have a certain job to, to block on each play, all right? And of course, there's the quarterback. And he's not just taking the snap from, that, from the center, right? He's reading the defense before the snap. And then after the snap, there are all these intricacies you learn as you pay attention to the game, all right? And, and those little nuances you start to pick up on. And, and, and you, you pick up on them as you listen to Tony Romo, right? <laughs> and, and then possibly Peyton Manning. Like there are rumors of that as a possibility, you know? All right. So <laughs> the same is true with the soul. Everyone, uh, uh, everyone right now is, is talking about self-awareness. You know, self-awareness is a, is a great thing. All right. It's especially a great thing for, for people that you have to live with and people you have to to work with, all right? But let me tell you, even better than self-awareness is soul awareness, all right? So just a quick review. I'll share this graphic I've shared a few weeks ago. When we talk about your soul, at the heart is your will or your spirit, your will or your spirit. Think of this as the command center or the coordinator of your soul, all right? This is why Solomon said in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard the heart. It is the wellspring of life, all right? You were created by God with a will and the power of choice is one of the most beautiful gifts that God has given us as human beings. We have the power with our will, with our heart to choose good or evil, to bless or curse, what car to drive, what profession do we choose? Uh, what do we wear? All right. We, we have the power of choice. This is our will. And the will is also referred to in scripture as a spirit, okay? So I think of spirit week in high school. There are those who participated in spirit week. We said they had the heart of the school, all right? They bled green and gold or, or black and gold. They, they bleed blue and yellow or they bleed navy and orange. So when I surrender my heart to Jesus, the Holy Spirit invades my spirit and, and he takes over and I have a new heart. Okay, Ezekiel 36, 26, Romans 8, 16, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Just a few, a few passages there, all right? Then we have our mind, which includes our thoughts and feelings. And with every thought, there is a feeling that is associated with it. And as I've said time and again, the mind is never neutral, which means that we're always thinking and we're always feeling. So we have to start thinking about what we're thinking about. We've got to pay attention. So many of us are exhausted because our minds are out of control. I've said this several times recently, but it bears repeating. Many of us, we have created a world in our minds that is divorced from reality and divorced from eternity. And you're living in this make-believe world and you're the only one there. And the danger of that is it leads to cynicism, which will destroy your soul. With my heart, my will, I can choose what I think about, all right? Then you've got your body, which are your appetites, habits, and desires. This is the part of you that interacts with the world that we live in, all right? Our body gets hungry, gets thirsty. We were created with God-given desires, for a God-given desire like sex, okay? Sexual desires, which is awesome. That's a great desire. But when desires, like all desires, when they get outside of God's will and we fulfill them apart from God's will, they disintegrate our our soul. We're, we're in inner conflict and turmoil. So regarding our body, we have words, uh, we have body language, and over time, our heart or our will, it'll outsource decisions to the body, which is where habits come from. They can serve us really well when it comes to tying our shoe. You don't have to think about tying your shoe anymore. Riding a bike, driving a car, so on. Habits serve us well when it comes to rising early and spending time with God in the morning. Uh, prayer, scripture memorization, other spiritual disciplines. In fact, let me just tell you, this is why fasting is so critical as a spiritual discipline because your body needs the reminder that it can't have everything it's screaming for, all right? I think about ice cream. A bowl of ice cream at night in front of the television every so often isn't a bad thing, all right? But every night, 
uh, probably not a good habit to develop. Uh, for me, it's cereal. Like what is it about cereal that you can't stop with one bowl, all right? Our body screams for attention. So we have to pay attention to our souls, all right? We got to keep our souls with all diligence. What happens when a football team is, is in complete alignment, all right? When the offense, the defense, the special teams, when they're all on the same page, look, that's not a good team. That's a great team, all right? And so when these three aspects of my soul are in alignment with God, you're talking about the reality and the power of the kingdom of God being present in your, in your life. And this is why Peter tells us to make every effort to add to our faith, to understand and the formation of our inner world and how it's going to impact the outer world, okay? So in verse five, for this very reason, say these words with me and highlight it in yellow, make every effort to add to your faith. We gotta make every effort, pay attention to our development, to what I'm currently experiencing and what I'm going through and, and what am I doing in this season? I'm adding to my faith, all right? What am I adding to my faith? Peter said, I'm adding goodness. Now remember what goodness is. Goodness is excellence and thoughts, feelings, and actions. Excellence in thoughts, feelings, and actions. Several weeks ago, I taught on it in a lot of detail. You want to go back and listen if you haven't already. And then what's happening? To my goodness, I'm adding knowledge. To my goodness, I'm adding knowledge. And what is knowledge? Knowledge is the ability to discern and orient life around God's will. All right. Remember, knowledge was paramount in the Hellenistic world, in the Greek world. So what Peter's going to do is he's going to go into culture and he's going to reclaim this word, this idea of knowledge for the kingdom of God. And, and he's going he's gonna to do the same thing with the next chain in the link that's being built. Look, look at what we read in verse number six. Peter says, and to knowledge, I'm going to add on, say it with me out loud, self Control, self-control. What is self-control? Self-control is a grip on desires and passions. A grip on desires and passions. Now, remember from a few weeks ago, I mentioned Peter was writing to con correct this false teaching that had crept into the church called Gnosticism, which created this div divide between the spiritual and the physical worlds. And so what it did is it produced this idea that you could live any way you wanted in light of the grace of God. Like do whatever, whatever feels good, just go and do it. And then you just ask for, for forgiveness. That's cheap grace. So Peter is going to bring truth to that lie and he's telling us that self-control is of God. Now, this is important. Our tendency is to want to control circumstances or control people, or we want to control outcomes. But very few people think about the only control that the Bible actually says we are to have, self-control. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and say it out loud with me, self-control. So where does self-control come from? How do we grow in self-control? How do I get a grip on my passions and desires? The answer is, it is the fruit of the Spirit of God. It's the produce of the Spirit of God. It's planted in my heart by the Holy Spirit. And when obedience to the Holy Spirit is a choice that I make, it becomes the produce of my life. So, so say this with me, and then I want you to write it down. Ready? Say it out loud. Self-control comes by living under the Spirit's control. Say it again. Self-control comes by living under the Spirit's control. Jesus said in John 15 that when we abide in the vine, our lives will bear much fruit. 
And abiding means resting in Jesus, trusting in Jesus, aligning ourselves with Jesus, paying attention to Jesus, listening to Jesus, doing what Jesus tells us to do, and then trusting Jesus with people and with outcomes. It's interesting that when you read First and Second Peter, he actually references self-control on several occasions. And as I prepare to close this morning, I want to look for just a moment back to First Peter chapter number one. All right. So in verse number thirteen, Peter writes, "Therefore, notice the highlight here. Prepare your minds for action. Be self." Controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Now, listen, these are not three separate commands that Peter gives us, all right? Set your hope fully on, all right? What, what this is, is the verb of emphasis in this verse, all right? The first two statements are clarifying in terms of what that looks like to set your hope fully on the grace of God. So think of preparing your minds, all right? There's the, the mind, your thoughts and your, your feelings, all right? What did Paul say in 2 Corinthians 10, 5? Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Remember what he said in Philippians 4, Eight, finally, brothers, whatever's true, noble, right, excellent, pure, lovely, think on these things. We've got to prepare the mind, pay attention to the mind. When Peter says, be self-controlled, all right, understand that this imagery, it comes from a world that was full of drunkenness, all right? So when a person is, is drunk, what happens? They lose complete control of their body. So we have self-control. How? Self-control comes by living under the Spirit's control. Self-control comes by living under the Spirit's control. This is why Paul said in Ephesians 5, 18, don't get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit, all right? Yes, the Spirit. Self-control comes by living under the Spirit's control. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance, all right? Finally, later on in 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse number 6, Peter wrote, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. There's so much I could teach you on in, in, that, in those two verses. But, but look at verse number 8. Be, say it with me, self-controlled and what? Alert. Why? Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Be aware, be alert. Why? Because the enemy is watching you. He's observing you. He sees your isolation, your loneliness. He knows your cynicism and he's waiting for the right moment when your guard is down, when you're not looking, not paying attention to attack. Be self-controlled. Self-control comes by living under the Spirit's control. Now, for anyone who right now feels like self-control is beyond you, I wanna encourage you that if self-control were not possible under the control of the Holy Spirit, God would have never said that we are to have it. And what he calls us to, he always empowers us to become. And who I am becoming matters to God. My growth matters to God. It matters now and it matters for eternity, the life to come. Now, while my eternal life is secure because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for my sin and because I have made a conscious decision to turn to him for my salvation, all right? Understand this, that how I spend eternity will depend on how serious I am about making every effort to add to my faith. We are one day going to rule and we are going to reign with him and learning self-control, learning to get a grip on my desires and passions is preparation for the ruling and the reigning in the world to come. So I wanna wrap up this morning with 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number eight. Peter says, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, 
they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For if you possess these qualities, understand that in the Greek, it means to begin below. Or think of it this way, beginning within, all right? Picture a seed that's being planted beneath the ground. And what God has done is he has planted the seed of self-control in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And with the master gardener, the helper, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, leading, speaking, instructing, and moving in us, we have everything we need to cultivate this seed of self-control so that it can grow in us. Control over our minds and control over our desires and our passions. It takes self-control every morning to pick up my Bible before I pick up my phone. It takes self-control when I have a few minute break throughout my day to have a conversation with God rather than check the news cycle. It takes self-control to not look to social media for my identity. Who you are is not the attention or the number of likes that your post gets. It takes self-control to guard your tongue and not resort to gossip or backbiting. It takes self-control to distinguish between being bored and being hungry. Am I really hungry right now or am I just bored? It takes self-control to stop with one bowl of cereal. It's going to take self-control to keep having dinner around the table as a family in the evenings, even when schedules start to get insane again. It takes self-control to have anger without anger having you. Because when your anger has you, what you're doing is you're telling the Holy Spirit to get out of the way while you handle this. Self-control comes by living under the Spirit's control. And as we close right now, I want us to pay attention. Who or what has control over me? I want to give you the opportunity to surrender whatever it is that is controlling you to the control of the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the time that you've given us today in your word. And Lord, we just believe with all of our hearts as your word has gone forth, that you right now have sent it, Lord, to accomplish your purposes, your kingdom purposes in our hearts, our minds, and our bodies, and our souls. And so God, I pray today, I pray that we would pay attention to what it is you're saying to us. And Lord, allow us to see, expose, Lord, anything that we are giving control of ourselves to other than you, other than your spirit, Lord. So Father, as you reveal those things, may we have an honest look within. God, may we have the courage to repent, to turn from whatever that is that has control over us other than you. And may we turn to you, Jesus, the good news of the gospel, turn to your grace, your grace that is sufficient for us. The grace, Lord, your grace, that is that, that, that power, Lord, is made perfect even in our weaknesses. So God, I pray that we would pay attention and that God, we would turn to you. And that Lord, we would begin to lean into you like never before for self-control as it comes from living under the control of the Holy Spirit. Lord, speak to us. Give us ears to hear, Father. Give us courage to obey. And I wanna pray, Lord, especially for anyone who's never trusted you as Lord and Savior, who's never made the decision to step from death into life. May this day, right now, as they hear these words, may this be the moment that you touch their hearts in such a way that they, they could not surrender to you. May this be the moment that they surrender to you, to your grace and to your goodness. And right now, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, whether you're watching with our dream team and Louisa, maybe you're watching online, wherever it is you are, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, as we right now stay in a spirit of prayer, I wanna give you the opportunity to say yes to Jesus for the very first time. And I'm gonna lead you in a prayer and I'm gonna ask you pray this prayer out loud after me. 
And as we do, I'm gonna ask everyone would join together to pray this out loud in support of those who are making this decision for the very first time. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sin. Come into my heart, cleanse me of my sin and give me the courage to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.